Welcome to Live Sense8. I'm Sheila Applegate. And I'm Zach Hansen. And a special shout out to Justin Applegate for the composition of the Live Sense8 podcast music. In this podcast, we dive deep into the concepts of consciousness and other interesting trivia in the Netflix original series, Sense8. We're doing an episode by episode exploration of how we can live a Sense8 life. And we're also talking with cast and crew and team members of Sense8 to hear the experience from their perspective. Enjoy the show. And this week's episode is brought to you by Divine Phoenix Books. Books with a purpose for a positive change. In this segment, we talk about what's going on in the world of the Sense8 fandom. But before we start, happy Pride Month, everyone. Zach and I were interviewed for Hanging with the Web Show. So look for that on YouTube. Zach followed Sense8 James and did an awesome job of introducing a whole bunch of new listeners to Sense8. So I'm hoping that will help get some traction and we'll have more fans for the show, which I'm sure you know, June 8th is the release of the Sense8 Season 3 special episode. Remember to watch it on Netflix. And if you watch it with friends, be sure that it is playing at home so that the stats record the real viewers. But you're probably going to want to watch it several times anyway. I know I do. (laughs) I've already watched it once, and I can't wait to watch it two times on Friday, once at home and once at a party. Sense8 Worldwide is doing a video countdown, and if you look for the day six, you'll see Maximilian and me, and on day four... You will have seen Zach. Speaking of Maximilian, the San Francisco Mural Project is still in process and will be launching the fundraiser soon. So stay tuned for that. Once that goes live, we're all going to have to come together and support that fundraiser. The I Am We campaign has extended its contest. So be sure to visit the I Am We campaign, both on Twitter and Facebook to download and print a poster to send snail mail to local LGBTQ organizations, media news agencies, press agencies, anyone who can propel the message forward. Take a photo of your letter or package before you mail it and tag I Am We Campaign on Twitter or Facebook or email the photo to Campaign at hotmail.com to be eligible to win an autograph from either Max Remelt or Brian Smith. That is, Wolfgang or Will. Next week's episode of Live Sense8 will be our first dive into the special episode, Love Conquers All. And as a very special thank you to all our Patreons for supporting us, We'll be doing an exclusive episode with Michael Summers, a.k.a. Bug, which will be posted on June 9th on the Patreon. So head on over to patreon.com forward slash livesense8 to take advantage of that special gift. And if you haven't listened already, last week's episode, Zach and I told all about our Chicago trip with Maximilian and the Sense8 cast and Lana Wachowski and the preview, no spoilers. But if you're riding that wave of being excited for June 8th and you haven't heard that yet, be sure to listen to that too. All right, let's get on with today's episode. Season 1, Episode 11, 
Just Turn the Wheel and the Future Changes, directed by Lana and Lily Wachowski, written and created by Lily and Lana Wachowski and J. Michael Straczynski, produced by Alex Bowden, L. Dean Jones Jr., Marcus Logis. Composer, composers, Johnny Kilmick and Tom Twiker. Cinematographer, John Toll. Let's dig in to this wild world of Sense8 today. It is a wild world in Sense8 today. We have Riley in the hospital. If you remember in episode 10, she passed out at the symphony. With a giant nosebleed. Right. And fell into some people in front of her. Like She just like toppled right over that. There's probably a couple people injured, I think. And she is in a hospital in Iceland, which we know from previous episodes could be dangerous. And Irsa is there with her. I don't know if we know that if she's there physically or Sensate E. Probably Sensate E. I would think so. I think that's cool. Like Irsa the Fiersa. That's her. That was her. Her Sensate nickname, probably. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving her that name. Perfect. <laughs> She's doing some fierce love. Now, Irsa, it's just going to be interesting as we talk later on in this episode about the clips, because um, we've got a lot to say about fierceness. There is a love in Irsa, but she's mean. Well, we talked about this. Fear is just a form of love. It's an expression of self-love. Right. Oh, and you were thinking fear. I was thinking fierce. It works in both ways. Man, we have the most brilliant nickname for Irsa now. She got way cooler because she has a nickname. <laughs> like, when did she get cooler? Oh, right now when we gave That's her right. the nickname. <laughs> All right, so she's kind of giving Riley the shit for almost dying, and then she's like, okay, now it's over for you. Just go ahead and die. That's what good friends do, right? They're there to tell you I told you so. <laughs> and hopefully get you out of jail. Really, Metaphorically Anna, speaking. Right. Well, you know what? If we go back to last episode 10 when we were talking and you said that when, you know, Kala was faced with the idea of the wedding not being there and then suddenly she was ready to fight for it. Actually, Irsa probably wasn't thinking it through, but she could have actually had the effect of making Riley fight if Riley picked up on that. Like, no, I fucking don't want to die. <laughs> I think I'll fight for this. In that scene in particular, I was like, oh, maybe Irsa is working for BPO. I just had that hunch. I did, too. I mean, I've not gotten a great feeling about yeah. her. But then there's a flash, and I was trying to remember this, like... It gets really mixed in with Angelica telling her to do, to shoot herself, too. But right. It's pretty twisted in here, I think. It is. We might not be know the answer to that for a very long time. Or ever, if at all. We'll have to leave it up to our imagination. I was going to say, we each can have our own answer. <laughs> anyway, Riley is pretty much... On her deathbed, you would say? Yeah, I think so. I my interpret that as a near-death experience. You know, the light and the angel coming to visit you at your bedside, which would be her her, her former husband yeah. on the other side and all that jazz. And then she's having some violent flashbacks to when her child was born and when her husband died and all of that. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to see a little more window into Riley in her subconscious. And then Nomi, Nomi says she'd help out, and she's all like, I would help out, but I can't because I don't have my computer stuff. And then there's this knock on the door. The fucking bug rolls in. <laughs> Saving the day one more time. What a cool cat. <laughs> you were a little freaked out watching. Bugs. I was. It was fun. It really was. <laughs> I was like, man, Mike is such a good actor. <laughs> When the imagining the way you saw behind the the screen to the Wizard of Oz, and I did. <laughs> and now he's he's human, but yeah, he does an awesome job as Bug. All right, and then Cavius takes Monday to Jella and asks him to watch her, and he knows what's going down to some 
idea. Jealous. This is one of those deep friendships. It is. And in my mind, Caffius puts Jella and his family in danger. Because people are watching him. Or the, yeah. the, 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 the crime lord's family. I forget his name at the moment. But they're being watched. Right, and I think, and he's driving around in this giant bus with Van Dam. It's not like he's hiding anywhere right. where he's going. Easily followable, this guy Caffius. So anyway, that was what I thought. I was like, oh man, jealous family's in danger because they're yeah. taking care of this high value target. Do you think that's one more incident where we see jealous faith in Caffius? Mm -hmm. Because you can see in his eyes, he knows what's going down. Right. And he knows he does. He knows he doesn't want he doesn't want Caffius to go. He doesn't want to put his family in jeopardy. And yet there this there's that underlying knowing of something about Caffius that his role is to trust him. Yeah, he's a he's a great friend that Jell. And one thing I've noticed about Caffius too is he doesn't like to put responsibility on others easily. So. Right. He that's how that was kind of Jella's cue too is oh he doesn't want to say where he's going or what he's doing and he's dropping this child off who is in danger at my house. Like there's some big flags there of something's not okay. Right. Right. And yet they do okay. They do okay. Um well, and then we know in it, Caffius goes on and he ends up standing up to the gang and fighting. Thanks for the Korean spirit of Asian lady Jean-Claude <laughs> Van Damme. Right. And we're going to... No, we don't have that clip. So we, we But don't. we do want to talk about that. Do we want to talk about that right now a little bit more? Um, sure, why not? <laughs> All right, let's talk about that now, Zach. All right, this is just uh, nitpicking. But the gang all had pistols in their hands when he walked in, checking every single one of those dudes had a pistol. And they're running, rummaging through the bus. They all have pistols when they're surrounding uh, Caffius when he's confronting the the leader of the gang. And then all of a sudden, when they go inside... There's no pistols except for like two. And that was just like, why? I don't, it's, it may, I know it would have made for a bad, bad sense eight season if they just shot Caffius like any reasonable person would do and you wouldn't have a good show. But I was just like, that's just not, they're gangsters. Come on now. So I looked at this and, and I thought that was true. Well, the, group that follows him that was outside and then follows him after with the guns actually they come in from outside so we are looking at a different group like a couple of them came in with them and the others stayed out why the others inside had machetes from a gang perspective we may not know but when i dove into this because there's a lot going on here and is it in character for Caffius to kill at the level that he did or mange I mean we don't know how many were dead and how many I don't know how that went down exactly they looked like a lot of dead people but I started to think about that as um, a metaphor in a way and and I wonder, I started to think about Caffius' personality. He did not, he would not kill. He refused to murder the person he did not have a reason to murder, right? He refused to bring the child to them. He refused to follow through and save his life by murdering someone who hadn't harmed him. But what he did was, with the union with son he protected himself from the ones that were attacking him. Um, so I think in his, to him, that's different. And that's still staying in character. Because I wasn't as concerned. I mean, I can get on to little loopholes. But I know 
we all have to agree to some level of that in because we you got to make a good show right well television isn't supposed to be reality right. <laughs> so so but to me it was just this pondering is this in character for him and to protect the child is in character to refuse to do something that's not in alignment with him is in character and to defend himself who he loves which is good and the people he loves is good it is something that would be in character to him i think and i like in the bus when he says thank you for saving me he's like that really wasn't in my plan <laughs> like i wasn't without this i was focused on saving the child and so all of those things feel in character to me after exploring that. Yeah, and we have uh you got you know, we have what would appear to be eight different people. There's one person that we watch and they just they just slip into different bodies. Right. So right. they have so all of those personalities Sun, for them. Sun yeah. and Wolfgang and Will, you know, they're the more violent ones and they're used to violence. Right. So it's easy for them. Right. But and it's totally out. Caffius didn't want to do that. Like he was he was I think he was angry because he was in that position and he got himself in that position and he tried to get out of that position. Like w being within the 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 crime syndicate, right? Mm -hmm. On one side of the fence or the other because he was working for one guy and now the other guys want him to do him right. a solid, right? So he's he's caught up in this. And that's why he was angry, punching the walls, because he didn't want to do any of it. Right, exactly. Right? That wasn't his intention. But then, son, she doesn't like being called a bitch. <laughs> so she's going she's gonna to cut some fools up. And what I've liked, so I liked that the guns weren't there because I liked, so you're looking at, there's a level, and they set it outside, let's set a list like men. And he uses a machete um, and to scare him. But Cavius doesn't move. Like, he was prepared to be killed right there. Like, if that's what was going down, that's what was going to go down. But by having... I think that in our society, we've disconnected from the empathic or compassionate or energetic process of death and killing like we kill wars with drones where you know our wars are for us at least in the united states are we're not seeing the ramifications mass shootings we see here but they're done mass like people there are not as many stabbings there's not as many one-on-one -on -one, um feel what you just did and I've talked about this with my daughter when we were watching TV before, too. Like, if we watch some of the old shows, like, there was something more civilized about sword fighting when we killed face-to-face -face and we knew what we were doing. And there was a code that we, the people who signed up, knew that they were going to fight each other. And I think there's a code within the gang that you know you can die. And there's, um, I don't know, I liked, I liked the representation of that because if we're going to keep having killing and murder and fighting and war, I think that bringing it back into the close up would be healthier for the human experience. Sure. I agree with that completely, you know, um, martial combat. You're connected to what's happening. You get to look that person in the eye and and have that whole experience and really be connected to it instead of you know, seeing them from afar and not seeing them at all. Right. And you have no idea. There's zero compassion in modern warfare. Right. So. And it's a total disconnect from cause and effect. Right. And that's why I liked that scene. Um, and even in it, the gang leader still like, like, there's a respect for each other. Like, um, the gang leader, as he's walking Caffius in, says, I like you, <laughs> you know? 
So, yeah. So the, I I like and I liked that back early on when Will went to the gang and we saw the respect between the police and the gang members and the ability. There's a sense of seeing each other as humans, even in those situations, that I think is missing. Since eights, humans, you know, sapiens, right? <laughs> Sensoriums and, and homo sapiens, whatever. Life, seeing life. Even our food, it, we're not seeing the process anymore. And I just think this is important. That's why I like that scene. Cool. I didn't enjoy watching the hand get cut off, though. <laughs> Even though it didn't look that real, which I was appreciative. It almost has like a, I don't know. Well, maybe it was more real, so it looked surreal. Yeah, that could be. Have you ever seen a real hand I get cut not, off? I have not, right? no, no. As Visu- visual effects artists study these things. Right. Like people really, we've gotten really good at portraying violence and gore on TV. Mm-hmm. Yay. Yeah. But... I think there's something to be said for that, that m- maybe, I don't know. I'm going to leave that thought. All right. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> we have Son's brother visits her in jail and then tells Son that her father committed suicide. And then Son says nah you killed him i don't believe you and so to me i was i watched the scene again very very closely and i was like where is his tell how does she know he's lying and i really couldn't tell the difference because we've only seen him in a few scenes in the show and you know he's a he's a shitbag like he's a liar he's a coward you know we know all of these things because of how he let his sister <laughs> um take the fall and he sent murderers to prison. Like you just know, but I couldn't really like tell that he was lying per se because I didn't know his character enough, but she knew. And so I thought that was cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was just BS and like he's, he doesn't have compassion and she just knows that about him. He hadn't. Yeah. She knows she had made the decision to put him in jail she knew him and she knew when she signed that i think that if he heard he wouldn't be so to me i saw her at first grieving but what i was watching her face a lot and to me it's his expression uh all the words he used all the words the description the details the emotion about it the the use of the culture of saying shame killed us it it was so prescripted um that i think plus she just knows her brother like you said yeah so you noticed this one that will brought kala to visit riley and you picked up on that was the first time we think so they did that where he was there, and because, and then he visited her to help her out in the temple. And then she asked where he was, and he was in two different places. And then they both went. To her. Yeah, it's like, and he he made a he had a line about that too. Like my mind's just in multiple places. He wasn't really where sure where he was. Right, he said something like, "My physical body's in Chicago, but I'm not all I'm." Right, because he was with her and with Riley, and yeah. not present wherever he was that was cool. right yeah somebody asked me this week what happens to the people in their physical world when they're traveling um because it seems like they go for long periods of time and what are their bodies doing which to me was an interesting question that i could answer because <laughs> i don't spend that much time in my body but my body keeps functioning. So I think it's how much attention, right? You can still function when you're, you know, like what are the bodies doing? First of all, we talked about it, they're going out of time, right? So when they travel like that, they're in a state of timelessness. So what 
appears in linear time like a half hour could be a second or a few seconds. In or the lifetimes world. if you're Gautama, the Buddha. Right. <laughs> and then, but at the same time, I think it's, you can put your attention in multiple realms. That's what I teach is how to do that. And it's the amount of attention that you put in each realm. So if you're being really, and you watch this with me, and I've seen it with you, but if if there's a high demand for a, my attention in another realm, then my functioning um, on earth in the physical realm gets more simplistic. It's harder for me to carry through. I might get Sleep. distracted. When it, right. So when, when a lot of attention is demanded, then it's time to sleep down here. You kind of have to, like you just have to. And we've seen that happen during the show, I think. So, but when, when it's not a high demand for attention, you can function. So the degree that you can function here depends on the level of attention being placed other places. Right. Well, and your body's kind of smart because, our conscious mind doesn't run our body. Right. <laughs> our subconscious mind takes care of 99.99% .99 of everything. We can't consciously think of all the functions that the body does in a split second. Right. Right. So it takes care of itself. Whoever designed this thing was pretty smart. So basically what we're saying is when they're traveling and spending a lot of attention in the other realms... They're just on Facebook or Twitter. <laughs> yep. <laughs> or Promote, playing Bejeweled promoting, or whatever that's promoting called. Promoting <laughs> Sensei or playing, playing Farmville or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have a, a clip here with, because we're speaking about Kala and how Will just helped her. So we have a clip here where um, Kala goes to the temple for the first time that we know of since the stabbing. Yeah. And there's a, a little shrine to the person they stabbed. And she's walking up the stairs. And here's the clip. Thank you. Thank you. No. It's we who should thank you. This means so much. Yes, so much. Remover of obstacles. As the obstacle to our faith was removed. What? Are you talking? She is our hero. She brought him here. No. Yes, God worked through you. No. Yes, you brought the defiler to us. You brought him where we could reach him at last. No one likes violence. God does not like violence. This is obscene. But he knows. Sometimes it is necessary. Don't touch me. You have nothing to be afraid of. You are one of us. Yes. yes. No. You are one of us. Don't touch her. If I see you, any of you here again, I will show you what violence looks like. So, God knows that we need to use violence sometimes. Hmm. <laughs> How about those apples? So just to be clear for people listening, if they don't, if you don't know that scene and you, it's harder to follow without seeing everything because, I mean, we talked about it, but so Will steps in and then she pushes the person to the wall and stops him. And that's the first time we see someone coming in and, well, Will helping her like that and, and see that more aggressive side of standing up for something coming out in Kala, which is very um, important, important. But yeah, another huge topic here. And we just talked about violence and obviously this scene, this, there's so much about violence in this episode and um, a couple right around it. I don't enjoy violence. <laughs> I don't enjoy looking at this topic. And when we start thinking about this clip in particular and 
you're one of us because there's always the us and, and them and that's how war and fighting can be and just it being about God and fighting for our God and and spirituality and this God figure creating so many wars for so long just makes me tired and heavy and I didn't even want to do the episode because of it. Like, it's just like, oh. <laughs> but then it, I started, I was like, okay, so I have to face this. <laughs> Thank you, Lana. And what is my way out, right? Like, how do I? <laughs> I'm like trying to find the teacher in me. How do you teach other people, Sheila? Find it, find it. And then I remember that there is no way out. It's what we talked about in episode 10, too. There's no way out. Like we said, language will never be enough down here in just the physical to explain the non-physical. There's no way out of this through the physical mentality, the way the small human mind or sensorium, because we talk about that too, um, where we're going to talk about that. But the way out for me is to move to higher consciousness in my attention, to know that the this shifts when we wake up and that we are most effective when we shift our attention to the higher consciousness where we are past this. For me, it's really, so in the very beginning of the show, this is a very prominent concept, is the idea of expanding your understanding and experience and concept of self. When you realize that you are the other person, you wouldn't do that to the other person. Right. You wouldn't commit violence when you understand that you're connected with everything. Right. Life would be so much different. And how do you do that? Well, <laughs> that's where practicing higher consciousness and empathy and compassion and all of these um, qualities of the human experience come in limbic resonance yeah and i think that's it's interesting too because it really gets into the layers of it and even the layers of it become a maze because we see the cluster expanding out in their consciousness we had Jonas talking last time about the difference between humans and sensates. And he even has a line that their lack of empathy makes it easy for them to kill. And yet we've got all these sensates killing. And we've got them fighting the BPO. So my issue then becomes that us versus them penetrates through the story and so we can't say sensates are fully evolved because they're doing the same thing. They're still struggling. They're just one step up, right? <laughs> like, they're still struggling with this. They still need to master this as well. I think there's a beauty in that because I think that represents us awakening too. And as we awaken, there's levels of that consciousness and when we try to merge that higher consciousness with a physical reality, it gets messy. I mean, we see it playing out everywhere, but we, and, and so it's, if you really look with the eye of consciousness, you can't be like, oh yes, the sensates, they got it, you know? They're the good guys, they're the ones that know, because they're not. They're doing the same, many of the same things that the humans are doing. Right, and humanity, this current version of humanity on this planet Earth, doesn't 
have the concept of a story that isn't this repetitive. Like, this is just the hero's journey repeating itself over and over. We have nothing else to tell. I know. So that's why it's like, it doesn't matter what. And this is, to me, this is why uh, entertainment is so bleh. It has been for years to me. Like, there's certain things that I do like, but I consciously understand what I'm watching. Right? I, I understand what triggers me to like things, or if I'm uh, deciding to watch a show like this or Game of Thrones or something, which they all come with their own um, debris or residue from watching them of a lower consciousness. It's entertainment, sure, and I can walk away, but it's just the same shit over and over again. It's because we don't have a concept. We don't have a contextual story or a contextual anything to realize life beyond peace. I know. And I've been (laughs) struggling with that struggle for a very long time now. But I, and I think that's where when I first heard that since it was going to be canceled, I, I I was so disappointed, but then I there was a part of me that was like, if the human race isn't ready, if if a new story can't be told yet that's beyond the hero's journey, and if this would just turn even more and more and more into a hero's journey, then I'm okay leaving it a little open-ended because maybe my brain we'll be able to get there somehow, you know, maybe we will as individuals be able to get there. But then when I look at Lana and I look at some of the things she's doing in there and it has to be bridged, we're bridging. She's bridging us from the, like you and I want to be past the hero's journey so much. And we've been working to see if we can write past it. And it's really, really hard. Like, I don't even know if our brains have it down here to do that. But this show has such potential. To, it is already bridging it, but you have to weave. And that's why this, this episode's become so frustrating to me. We do move beyond it a little bit, but not fully because it goes back to that. We don't, without it, we, you know, that's what Justin said when he was like seven, eight years old. Right. Without conflict, we have no plot. We don't know, but. That's right beyond the hero's journey. This is my plea to the universe. (laughs) It brings me to the whole concept of empathy and limbic resonance. And when you, I can identify with yourself as another through, we'll use limbic resonance, right? Because that's the most grounded scientific approach. We, We have to explain the phenomenon of connectedness. It doesn't matter, you know, that a lot of people have um, empathy towards animals. Mm -hmm. A lot of empathy, right? They'd rather not see a stray dog go hungry than another human being be beat up like it's worse for them, right? Right. So, And so there's just this strange thing. But anyway, my point about empathy is if the Sense8s truly had empathy the way we would like them to have empathy. <laughs> right. They would feel the pain of the pe- like Caffius just murdered 20 people or maimed them or whatever. He would be feeling that. Right. Because he is connected to those gang members that he just he had to he had to survive, right? So it's it's fear based, it's survival based. That's, you know, we're just a product of our environment and we react to things that happen in our lives, but Even if he were a real empath and connected, he would be grieving the the fact that he did that, even though he made a conscious decision with son's help to murder those people. Right. There's that, and I completely agree with it. Then there's the whole idea if you, and this is, it's just, you just, it's loophole after loophole, right? Because then you can also move into, if you know that life in the physical form is a tiny speck of all that we are and that physical life and death is an illusion, then you're not going to be as 
um, upset when people die. So, but that's a higher consciousness in some ways, and yet it lacks empathy in another way. So is empathy the ultimate, or is it this merging of consciousness and empathy that allows us to move forward? Well, when I said, spoke earlier in uh, earlier podcasts, and I was talking about life-based belief systems, I really didn't elaborate on that a whole lot because it's a huge topic. But I mean, that's the idea is to understand that this is an illusion. Yeah. We really, whatever, our experience is going to change, but we're not going to stop having the experience after we put down our human computer suit whenever that time comes. Right. And that's the fear of dying is, oh, we're just not going to exist anymore. But the majority of the planet believes in an afterlife. So it's just a ridiculous idea. It's just we're programmed to think because we need to survive as a species, right, to have self-preservation. And when we break that, when we transcend the barrier of survival into a life based belief system then our behaviors will reflect those beliefs because all beliefs dictate behaviors so when we truly experientially believe that means to know that life is beyond death we won't act out in fear because we know life will continue right so we wouldn't have to preserve we wouldn't have to buy into this idea of lack or or loss or anything else because all of it is just this really juicy beautiful nightmare of the human experience for right now and as you say that i am remembering caveus before he went into that scene and he stood there without fear unmoving when the machete was lifted and and cut in micro micro spec from killing him you know he was prepared to die so maybe he actually does have some level of relationship to death that made it easier for him to walk away from that without being overcome by that empathic reaction yeah, and I think that's where he goes, he laughs at him when he says, let's do this like men, because like, there's this macho idea that we're just going to duel it out and everything's going to be okay. That's not very smart, right? That's very, um, that's a brutish approach. So what he does is he takes him into this room and tries to manipulate him because he's an asset, right? So it's, it's not smart to duke it out like men. It is smarter to dominate and subjugate somebody He's going to have some dirt on Caffius, right? He's going to make Caffius feel terrible for killing this man because he didn't want to. Well, he thought he could. Right. Right. But I'm just saying, like, there's this other element of um, emotional violence and domination and subjugation and things that's... So, so it's kind of a mockery of let's do this like men. No, let's do this like smart gangsters or not gangsters, like our military does, everybody does this to a certain extent. But what he's also saying is he's reflecting that knowing of not, he has, in a sense, that element of not being afraid of death himself, that the real pain comes when you have to live through grief or through emotional distraught. So he wanted to kill the daughter. He wanted to use the situation to upset Caffius and make him live, like you're saying. So it actually makes the gang leader, it represents that he actually understands that death isn't the ultimate pain. Right, that'd be life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Life is the hell, so I'm not going to give you the past. In, in our current condition. <laughs> yeah. Or in that scene. In their, in their current condition. So sh this is kind of, you know, more of that. Shall we go on to another clip? This is Wolfgang and Kala now. And Wolfgang is... In at, front of his uncle's mansion. Mm -hmm. Kala, I don't think, knows fully what's going to go down, but um, she gets a really bad feeling. 
She knows that. So I guess they know each other. So she probably knows what what um, Wolfgang's intentions are. And this is the title. She says that you can turn the world, the wheel. And the future changes. Yeah. So she wants him to turn the wheel and just not do this. And he explains to her why that's not an option for him. This is a bad place. You should not be here. You don't have to do this. You could just turn around. It is so simple. A thing. Just just turn the wheel and the future changes. It is not that simple. It is. You stopped your wedding, but it's still going to happen. You don't know that. Some things in our lives are inevitable. Don't do this. They will kill you. There are worse things than dying. Wolfgang, please. There are things I will never be able to understand about your world. Just as there are things you will never understand about mine. I understand how I feel about you. Somehow, I know that you feel the same way about me. This is why I'm here. After what I did, as long as that man is alive, no one I care about will ever be safe. The theme continues. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, I—I I mean, he says there's worse things than than dying. Than dying, and that's—I agree with him. Yeah, me too. When I think about dying, um, it's the pain that I would cause my children. You know mm-hmm. that it's the pain of who. You know, if I, uh, dying an early death would be the pain that I left behind, but. What he's saying is the same thing. He knows how they're going to work, and she wouldn't be safe. Nobody he cares about would ever be safe because they know don't don't hurt. It's not about killing. Wolfgang doesn't care if he's killed. As we're talking about this and we're reflecting on the pain that death causes, to me, I just had this kind of notion that it was you know it doesn't it's never i've said this before it's never a good time to die for anybody right and there's always pain involved and so it's interesting as we're born into this world there's a lot of pain when we leave this world there's not a lot of pain for us per se personally but there's so much pain around us that we cause for other people. So it's almost like a reverse birthing process where there's a birth that happens through our death, but it stays here, so to speak. There's so many um, instances when we are opened up as an individual because somebody very close to us passes on. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's, it's a, a birth, I will call it like an awakening of a birth with inside of us, like there's grief, but sometimes there can be much more than grief that manifests within us when somebody crosses over. So I just thought it was a very interesting uh, thing that I noticed that there there is a, a new beginning even in death here on the physical plane within those around us. Mm-hmm. And as I'm thinking about this Wolfgang isn't playing the same game as the family. I mean, he did just kill his cousin in the last scene. Um, he's not, his goal isn't to torment his uncle or to get revenge or to create suffering, right? Because suffering would be him living. Right. Um, well, it's going to cause suffering for his uncle too, right? Because he's going to suffer 
and want revenge until he's dead. Right. Right. So it's not, there's a lot of air quotes suffering going on. Right. No, I meant like life. if he yeah. wanted, if he wanted his uncle to suffer, then his goal would just be to rub the death of his right. cousin. We don't know right yet what he's going to do when he goes into that mansion, but he's saying, as long as this guy lives, you aren't safe and the people I care about aren't safe. So I think we know his intention and it's just, there are times when it's a, um, yeah, there are times when you just, he says that turn the wheel, you know, he says there are things, some things you can't change. And, um, I thought about, do I, do I really believe that, you know? I do in some ways because I think our higher selves make some decisions that may be in the highest good of all concerns that our physical selves could never make. And for me, I've talked about when my twin flame died, but we knew that was coming and there was a whole week of um looking back on it very surreal decisions that were made right up to the last minute that it seemed like could change it or and even two days before he said goodbye to me and he said i don't know if i'm coming home and this wasn't because of a gang war it was because of a higher consciousness knowing and he did make it home. And I, and I remember staying up and just praying all night. And he came home and he said, I had such a bad feeling. I felt, I just knew that either me or one of my cousins would die or go to jail for a very long time. Within days and maybe months for the cousin, but both of those things happened. And they weren't relevant to anything that was going on in the physical world in that night. It was just a knowing. And when I went in to clear some of it with a healer, um, he, he asked me how long I had been suspended and out of my body when he heard the story, because we went through that whole process. There were no physical decisions. Neither of us would have made that down here, though we were physically going through all of those steps. So on a very real level, at one of the most difficult situations, I can say that that's true. I think it happens to us in smaller levels and we get frustrated with it, but sometimes when it happens that profoundly, it's like, oh yeah, that happens. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, this, this situation with Wolfgang, he could have turned the wheel. Nothing would have changed other than like this, the same situation, it would eventually catch up to him. It's just how, the question is, how is he going to live with this? Right. Right. That, what, what, what is he going to choose to how to continue life or death? Right. He, he's basically knows he's walking into a death trap. Right. He's way outnumbered. Everybody's armed. He has a pistol. Like he, the odds are not in his favor. Right. right. So, and it's okay for him to die because he doesn't want us to sit, the, he doesn't want this to chase him for the rest of his life and him have to deal with another Felix situation. But he could have. Right. And he says, I don't remember the exact line, but he goes, you know, since I started this, it's not going to end or with what I did. And I remember thinking, what you did, like when, what you did yesterday, when in the last episode, when you killed his son or what you did when you stole the diamonds stole the diamonds or what you did when you killed, killed your, your dad right what you did when you chose to learn how to unlock safes uh, as a way of prevent like getting over your dad you know that sort of took on that passion and some sort of so where was that decision that led him to that point we don't really know but at this point, he knows he can't keep living. And now 
the people he cares about, which really seemed down to Felix and Kala, or the cluster. And Felix is in jeopardy, and he knows now the cluster's in jeopardy, and he can't. He can't let it continue now. There's your empathy, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, but Wolfgang doesn't seem to feel any um, empathy to those he puts down. No, and I think that, again, comes from what we were talking about. Life is hell. So what's dying? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's not, yeah. I mean, when you're faced with the the fires of life every day, death has no meaning. So this carries on after... That scene is pretty much near the end, and then it carries on to um, Hala visiting Sun. We have a clip for that. I can't feel what you're feeling. This is what life is. Fear, rage, desire, love. To stop feeling emotions, to stop wanting to feel them, is to feel death. What do you suggest I do? I take everything I'm feeling, everything that matters to me. I push all of it into my fist. I fight for it. What a heroic thing to say. <laughs> I really like that line. It's coming from Sun in particular. Yeah, and I I I love it really is a great way to end this discussion and this episode because it's like we're talking life and death and we've talked about all this, you know, violence and empathy and, and, and she's, she's nailing it when she says to stop feeling is to feel death. And from my perspective, <laughs> and, and I've been fighting <laughs> for people to feel my whole life. That's what my fist does. And I was thinking about it, you know, like for Sun, she, the symbol of she puts it in her fist, but we talk about our hands is um, what we create with, what we work with, what we do, whatever, what we touch. It's that touch. It's the, it's, it's opposable thumbs. <laughs> Which me. One of my favorite things. <laughs> He used to always tease our dog that he didn't have opposable thumbs, <laughs> which was really rude. But yeah, so so I thought, you know, it's not necessarily, like for Sun, it is the martial arts, but for Lana, it's writing for or creating or for for the actors, it's acting for... Others, it may be teaching. For us, it's the podcast. You know, it's taking the full spectrum of emotion and everything you love. And I think that's why we don't give up. Maybe my fight isn't with violence or pushing against something, but it's this like cheerleading, like, come on, people, there's something more. And I try every angle to try to, uh, fight for that idea that there's something more, that there's a wonder in life. And we all have our own fist, and what our fist does is unique to us. And if you're not living, you're dying, right? And even in the spiritual world, so many people start to segregate their emotions and not experience um, the bad emotions <laughs> And 
that's dying. Like that's you might they tend to not want to live. They're just floating around. Sometimes they're peaceful. Hey, I did this for a while, hanging out outside of my body, acting all chill, <laughs> you know. And then I was like, there's more to this. There's a living life passionately bringing that down in and experiencing all emotions. And then as long as we're here, use our hands to do something and our minds and our heart, our bodies. I really like how you um, explained that analogy with the fist because it would have been so easily just to go, oh, I want to fight. Right. Because son... She's a fighter, and that's what she does, and she's a badass fighter. And I'm going to fight, and I'm going to beat people up. Yeah. But that's really <laughs> not – it's it's more about creation, right? Yeah, I And so, so if you're a fighter and that's what you do, fight. <laughs> if you're a writer, write. You know, that kind of thing. If you, if you paint, paint. Right. If you, if you weave baskets, weave baskets. If you do quilts, quilt. Pottery, you know, if you <laughs> plant plants, plant plants. Work with the <laughs> land, whatever it is. The the concept there, though, I, I really liked how you put that, is just be creative with your emotions. And that's one of the things, especially anger for me, um, is learning to channel all of my anger and rage into creativity. Because that's really what's functional. Mm -hmm. right? Destroying something isn't really that functional. But when we can create or spread a message or, and it doesn't even matter if anybody listens to it, you know, it could just be for us personally, but when we use our metaphorical hand to create and, and channel our emotions, we can express ourselves in a much more healthier way. So I like what you did there for us, Sheila. Thanks. You're welcome. You know what? I... I'm so bubbling up inside with excitement and passion for Sensei and for Lana and all the creators again, which is so cool because we started the podcast off this time kind of heavy with like, uh, here we go again, the hero's journey is taking over. But it is being infused. The other ma message, the, the create with something, use your emotions the solutions are hidden right within this. And so maybe our world isn't ready to completely throw out the overarching story line of a hero's journey, but creation is ready to seep in and start to sprout in every direction. And that's what we're seeing. And that part excites me. Maybe I want to be at the finish line, but I might as well enjoy the journey. Right on. Yeah. So that's pretty exciting. I think, you know, this has been an intense conversation, and I think we covered a lot, and I feel really excited about the space we reached. Let's all go create. That wraps it up for the show today. To conclude this episode, I just want to remind you that we are going to have a very special episode with Michael Summers, in which we dig into the Love Conquers All episode and discuss it and many other things. That is a special thank you episode to all of our Patreon supporters. To become a Patreon supporter, you can head over to patreon.com forward slash live sense eight. Support us, grab your extra content, exclusive content, and support the show so we can grow. And I got to give a big shout out to Miss Sarah Applegate. Thank you very much for editing our podcast. And thank you for listening in today and giving us all that social media love. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for supporting us. And as always, thank you very much for spending your time here with us at the Live Sense8 podcast. We really appreciate it. And until next time, live that Sense8 life.